Hello everyone, this is Lindsay Clark, your primary instructor for molecular diagnostics, and this is our lecture on molecular detection of inherited diseases. So the objectives for this lecture are, number one, briefly explain Mendelian patterns of inheritance as exhibited by family pedigrees. Number two, discuss chromosomal abnormalities with respect to number and structure. Number three, relate disease syndromes with affected genes. Number four, list examples of laboratory methods designed to detect single gene disorders. Number five, briefly discuss single gene disorders with non-classical patterns of inheritance. And number six, discuss the major limitation of molecular testing. So we'll start out with a little review, mutations um, and polymorphism. So mutations are variations in DNA sequences. And we know that we can have mutations in germ cells and those result in inherited diseases. Mutations in somatic cells, on the other hand, can result in cancer or other congenital malformations. Now remember, polymorphisms are variations in DNA sequences also, and they can be found within genes or outside of genes in the non-coding regions. And benign polymorphisms can actually be useful for mapping disease genes, identity testing, um, like we've talked about, and determining parentage, so like the paternity testing that we've talked about. Now when talking about the molecular basis of disease, we also need to know about epigenetic alterations, which those can cause a change in phenotype without actually changing the genotype. So there are no changes to the primary DNA sequence in that case. Now these can become heritable changes in the gene expression. And there are three forms of epigenetic alterations that I wanna talk about. And that includes DNA methylation, genomic imprinting, and chromatin remodeling. In DNA methylation, methyl groups added to DNA, which can change the activity of a DNA segment without changing the sequence. Genomic imprinting selectively inactivates chromosomal regions, and chromatin remodeling sequesters large regions of chromosomal DNA. We talked about genome mutations in a previous lecture. Now remember, these mutations result in abnormalities in chromosome number. Detection of genome mutations can be done through karyotyping, ploidy analysis by flow cytometry, or through FISH. An example of a genome mutation is Edwards syndrome, and this manifests with a third copy of chromosome 18, and this is also known as trisomy 18. You can see in the image, there's a karyotype that includes that third chromosome there, um, number 18. Now, chromosome mutations, if you'll recall, result in abnormalities in chromosome structure. This can include insertions, deletions, inversions, and so on. And these types of muta mutations can be detected by karyotyping, high-resolution fish, or microarrays. And an example of chromosome abnormalities include DeGeorge syndrome and Cré-Duchat syndrome. And DeGeorge syndrome is caused by a deletion on the Q arm of chromosome 22. And you'll see there under the image of the chromosome, we have DEL and then 22Q in parentheses. And that just um, represents the deletion on the Q arm of chromosome 22. Transmission patterns are the same as patterns of inheritance, and there are patterns of inheritance that follow Mendel's model, and there are some that do not, and those are called non-classical patterns of inheritance. So some terms to know related to transmission patterns, penetrance and variable expressivity. Now penetrance refers to the proportion of genotypes that actually show expected phenotypes. And variable expressivity refers to a range of phenotypes seen in individuals with the same gene lesion or gene mutation.
And you'll see in this image here to the right, that's just an example of a pedigree, um, which kind of diagrams out the inheritance pattern. Um, if you do anything with genetic testing in your lab, it's possible you'll see these um, with the paperwork that goes with your specimens. So there are three Mendelian patterns of inheritance that I want to go over, and that includes autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and X-linked or sex-linked, because remember your X chromosome is a sex chromosome. And we'll talk about all of these in a little bit more detail next. And just to remind you, there's a little photo um, image of Gregor Mendel and his little P um, inheritance experiment that he did. And this one's actually depicting where he did um, looking at dominance of round smooth peas versus wrinkled up peas. So autosomal dominant disorders involve a mutated gene that is a dominant gene on an autosomal chromosome. So if we look at this, a child of an affected individual plus an unaffected mate will have a 50% chance of expressing the disease phenotype and a 50% chance of being unaffected. So I want you to know this term, autosomal dominant, and this image here just shows you if you have an affected father with an unaffected mother, your orange genes are normal, your blue genes are abnormal, and if your trait is dominant, if your child has even one abnormal gene, um, they will be affected. And so that shows you that 50% could be affected and 50% could not. Now, to have an autosomal recessive disorder, you must have two mutated genes, one from each parent. And many of these disorders are usually passed on from two parents who are carriers. So a child of an unaffected individual and an unaffected carrier would have a 50% chance of being affected. A child of two affected individuals has a 100% probability of being affected. Two parents who are unaffected car carriers have a 25% chance of having an unaffected child, a 50% chance of having an unaffected child who is a carrier, and a 25% chance of having an affected child. So if you look here in this image, it shows an unaffected father who is a carrier, an unaffected mother who is a carrier. Your orange is your normal genes and your blue are your abnormal. And so you can see the probability um, they would have 25% chance of having an unaffected child, 50% chance of having an unaffected child who is a carrier, and a 25% chance of having an affected child. So I just want you to be able to work those out. If you've done Punnett squares in the past, um, you'll be familiar with those also. So X-linked transmission patterns are carried by females, but they are most often found in males, and they almost always follow a recessive pattern. So a mother who is a carrier will have a 25% chance of having an unaffected son, a 25% chance of having an affected son, a 25% chance of having an unaffected daughter, and a 25% chance of having an unaffected daughter who is also a carrier. Now before we discuss some specific single gene disorders that follow the Mendelian patterns of inheritance, let's define single gene disorders. So single gene disorders affect the DNA sequence in one gene. These disorders can affect the structural proteins, enzymes, cell surface receptor proteins, or growth regulators. There's a table in your textbook that outlines single gene disorders of each type. Now this chart is an adaptation of that table and covers those disorders that would affect structural proteins. So we can see the hemoglobinopathies. Um, an example would be sickle cell anemia. It's got the gene location, the type of mutation, and the molecular methods used for um, detecting those diseases. So I want you to be familiar with that chart um, in your textbook. Um, and I want you to pay close attention to the molecular methods used to detect these types of diseases. 
Now I do want to highlight one single gene disorder, cystic fibrosis. CF is an autosomal recessive disorder and it can cause severe lung damage and nutritional deficiencies. So what happens, the mutation affects cells that produce mucus, sweat, saliva, um, and digestive juices. And it causes the secretions to be thick and sticky instead of thin um, like they should be. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a loss of function of the CF transmembrane conductance regulator, or CFTR. So the gene affected is the CFTR gene on chromosome 7, the Q arm. It is region 3, band 1, subband 2. And you can see all the letters and numbers there next to the CFTR gene. That's what that represents. We know that there are over 2,000 mutations and variations in that gene, but the most common is a three base pair deletion that removes a phenylalanine residue from position 508 of the protein. That is notated as F508DEL. And that DEL represents deletion. So many labs test for the most common mutations or variations rather than testing for all 2,000. So there are common kits out there that will include tests for 39, 60, or maybe 72 of these mutations and variations. And they often can be um, sort of customized based on your location as some of these genes, um, gene mutations are different depending on what population you're working with. Now, all 50 states in the U.S. will screen for cystic fibrosis as part of a newborn screening. And the screening test they do is for IRT, which is a chemical produced by the pancreas. But this screen is not very specific for CF. So I know in Arkansas, the positive screens are confirmed with a multiplex PCR that actually is a qualitative genotyping test. So genetic testing is important for early intervention for newborns diagnosed with CF. Other molecular testing methods that you can use to detect CF include PCR RIFLIPS, SSCP, SSP PCR, bead array technology, and direct sequencing. So moving on to single gene disorders with non-classical patterns of inheritance. These disorders can be categorized as gonadal mosaicism, mitochondrial mutations or genomic imprinting among others and these single gene disorders do not follow Mendelian rules of inheritance instead they involve multiple alleles and they produce I'm sorry produce different proportions of phenotypes in the offspring an example of non-classical transmission patterns is ABO blood types and you can see that the genotypes result in a range of phenotypes Gonadal mosaicism refers to the generation of new mutations in germ cells. Now the mutated cells give rise to eggs or sperm carrying the mutation and that can become a heritable phenotype. Now phenotypically normal parents can have more than one affected child. An example of gonadal mosaicism is osteogenesis imperfecta. And testing methods used to detect these types of disorder include next generation sequencing, Sanger sequencing, and Southern blot. Mitochondrial mutations are passed down from the mother. Now this always makes me think of that ludicrous song, she get it from her mama. Um, anyway, so just remember mitochondrial mutations come from mother. Now mitochondria actually contain their own genome and they have 37 genes. And mutations in the mitochondrial genome affect energy production. Remember your mitochondria is powerhouse of the cell, produces energy. Um, and so often these will manifest in energy demanding organs. So they, you'll find them in the muscles and the nervous system. So an example of a mitochondrial mutation would be kearns sayer syndrome. And you can see a southern blot demonstrating a mitochondrial deletion mutation in the image here to the right. Besides southern blot, you can use PCR, PCR reflips, and sequencing to detect mitochondrial mutations. <laughs> 
And genomic imprinting occurs when only one working copy of a gene is inherited instead of two. So uniparental disomy refers to the inheritance of chromosomal material from only one parent due to abnormal chromosome separation during meiosis. Now this can lead to genomic imprinting. And an example of this is chromosome 15. If there's a deletion from the, parental, the paternal chromosome 15, the result is Prader-Willi syndrome. However, if the deletion on chromosome 15 is from the maternal side, from the mother, the resulting disorder is Angelman syndrome. So testing methods for genomic imprinting include cytogenetics, karyotyping, fish, PCR reflips, and short tandem repeat analysis. While molecular testing has come a long way and has allowed us to gain more insight into DNA and disorders caused by mutations in DNA sequences, there are still limitations to this kind of testing. So molecular testing may uncover genetic mutations even when no symptoms are present. And this can sometimes lead to more questions or conversations about whether to treat the condition or not. Even with molecular testing, we're not always able to predict the phenotype or how severely it will be expressed, especially in genes with variable expressivity. Treatment for many disorders are directed at the phenotype rather than the genotype. So in some situations, extensive testing to determine the genotype just really is not necessary. So it's important to know that while these tests are very helpful in diagnosing many disorders, there are limitations to this type of testing. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. And if you guys have any questions, um, please contact me at the information on the slide and I will be happy to assist you.